you and your neighbor, you have essentially have the same genome, right? And the differences between your genes, between your genes and my genes, essentially they don't matter, right? Do you believe that personalized medicine is like there's one drug going to be there for you? And what do I mean by personalized health is harnessing the power of diversity? Let's begin with mapping the genomic diversity. You all may have seen the genome, the DNA, this double helix here. That's the information, that's the library. We have three billion of these, and they fit into 4,000 books as you see them here. Every letter in these books is one letter in your genome. Now, the thing that really does the life are the proteins. So this is not protein bars, this is machinery that acts through shape, and they have amazing shapes. The machinery of life, of these we have about 20,000. In 2000, the entire manual was done for us. It's a library-sized manual. We now know the manual. Does it mean we know how life works? Well, Anna Tramontano says it's like with every good manual, right? Most of the time you don't find what you're looking for. And if you really find it, you don't understand it. <laughs> and this is a lot about the, the, the genome here, and that has in fact started the Odyssey. One aspect of that Odyssey is initially it was assumed that one genome would be enough. Then it was realized that we have to do more than that. So study diversity by sequencing 1,000 people. What we found out by that is we differ by 20,000 letters in our proteins alone. On this Bavarian coat of arms that you see here, the red points are the ones where we have different letters, you and I. The blue ones are where the letters are identical. Now you may argue this is not a lot of red in all of that blue. But mind you, of my 55 trillion or so cells, most of those have exactly the same library to the letter of those 4,000 books. And behind that background, this red is a lot. So the next question becomes, the 20,000 differences between you and I, do they matter? Sure, you, 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 you look nicer than I. Uh, piece of cake, right? But do, do they matter in, in any other way? Do they have some serious impacts. If we did experiments, we could answer that maybe even at 30 years from now. Meanwhile, if you want to have an answer today, we have to explore computers. And Jana Bromberg at Rutgers University has developed a method that she calls SNAP that in fact mines the wealth of the experimental results by machine learning. Shown is something that is called a neural network. So the input here is one of these variants between us. And the output is either it has an effect or it doesn't have an effect. So if we came in with it, that would be the original structure. Effect means that you completely take it apart, it doesn't function anymore. Or that you sort of have a different function. Not effect would be, it essentially looks the same thing. So let's just explain how well this method works. What I show here on this axis, on the x-axis, is on the right hand, 100% effect, red. So the protein really changes or does something new. On the left side here, the green means it's very neutral. Nothing differs, right? And on this axis here, on the y-axis, I'm going to show you the percentage of all the mutations that I'm going to look at. Let's assume that I had a very, very good method, and I triggered it with a data set of things that have an effect here in red. Then they would all be predicted to have an effect. If I triggered it in green with a data set that has no effect, then they would all be predicted to have no effect. And just to show you two points here, so effect of 82% is for 98% of all the cases of this red set here, of the green set, about 100 minus 25, so 75 left of that. And that's what is supposed to sit on the green side of the neutral. How good is the method? So this is biology. And the world best method is shown here, nowhere near as good what the ideal method would do. Triggered by experimental effect, it looks like this. Triggered by experimental neutral, it looks like this. The difference here to the upper right is the mistake of the positives or of the effect variants. Here are the mistakes of the neutral ones. Conversely, the degree to which these two curves are pulled apart is the power of the method. What if I triggered that method with a set of mutations that we know one single mutation, if you carry that, you're going to evolve, have a particular disease. So really bad disease mutations. 
that the system has never seen before. And that was done by Chris Schaefer and my group. And you see orange here are the disease mutations. They have even more effect than the experimental data. This is because disease is such a consistent data set. Diseases are bad and they provide very clean data. So the method works. Now we have the baseline with which we can in fact study effects or the protein changes, does something new or not for all the 20,000 between us. What do we expect? Well, clearly we all are healthy in the sense that we all walked in here. We got to this point. We are not full of these bad mistakes that killed us. It's not that 20,000 things killed us over the last 20 years. We are here. And that's one definition of healthy. So we assume, therefore, that the mutations would be somehow selected towards the neutral part here, toward the green. And that's work from Yannick Malik, Dominic Acton, and Max Ekt in my group. Where are the, mutation, the variants between us? They're in between. The differences between us here in purple, that means they are close, to, as close to the disease kind of situation as they are to the neutral kind of situation. We are a living group. We are a species that is diverging, that is changing. What if we looked at the mutations between our ancestor? So we looked at all the differences between us and an early human. So now, for us, the 20,000 differences, we talk about the same 20,000 proteins, and there are 20,000 changes. If I compare us now to early human, I have much more of differences. So now I have to find the, uh, the corresponding proteins and so forth and so on. But if I look at those, then what I see is this light blue. So that's more neutral. I go a step further. I look at gorilla, even more neutral. That is where our ancestors, millions of years ago, departed. Those were neutral mutations. Between us, we have a lot of effect mutations. In fact, one-fourth of the 20,000, so 5,000, have a very strong effect. And about 12% have even an effect that is as strong as a disease mutation. That compelled uh, Jana Bromberg to a paper that shows that, in fact, weekly effect variants define individuality, and that she published in PNAS, and she made a very compelling case. I've been talking about disease and change. It's also true that not every change is bad. Sickle cell anemia, or sickle cell disease, is a very bad disease that comes about from a single letter change. Three mil billion, one change causes that disease. You carry that change, you will have that disease. It is very prevalent in malaria areas. Interestingly enough, that same mutation the carrier is resistant against malaria. So the carrier gets one bad disease, sickle cell disease, but actually survives a much worse disease, malaria. So what is good is bad. Or what is bad is good. In this particular case, this is the surviving strategy in some sense. So again, between us we have a, a lot of really strong mutations. What now if we could separate out the bad effect and the good effect, and in fact s reduce of the mutations that really matter, let only the good ones survive. What if we could do that? And is personalized medicine the answer to that? Personalized medicine, again, may, you may think about it as the drug tailored to you. But okay, here's a reality backup. What I show is the year on the x-axis, on the y-axis, the number of new drugs. You may be able to see this number up here, the top number is 40. Of the last 15 years, there were never more than 40 drugs in a given year onto the market. A single drug costs $2 billion, over $2 billion, and it takes over 14 years to develop. So it's very clear, there will not be a drug for everyone in the room. So personalized medicine is not personalized drug. What it will be, however, is personalized health, so that your genomic profile will choose which drug to take, will help in the diagnosis, will help in you choosing your food. That's personalized health. That will come with genome profiling. And that can then help to, in fact, exactly push the bad effect away and let the, the good effect survive. In conclusion, we have a story here that is between the individual and society in many ways. It is on the one hand that 
the changes that we have have to do with who we are. But some of them are possibly bad for us. I want to be an individual, I want to be different. But not if that is a disease. I want to get rid of everything that makes me sick, right? Clearly, the living population, the living group here, has a much higher effect sensitivity than what happened in the past, the frozen line here. And this is because evolution plays somehow, let's call it a game. If I have a bad mutation that kills me, Simon, it's, it's, it's bad for me, but it's not bad for the species. However, the same mutation, in the, like in the sickle cell disease situation, could help my offspring to survive some future damage. And that is why evolution dares this game. For us as a species, that helps. So we have the situation where what is good for the species may not necessarily be good for me. Yes, I want to be individual, but I don't want to be sick. Uh, and that's the point where personalized health comes into play. That's the point where exactly the genomic profiling of personalized health can help us to, in fact, check what is good and what is bad. Helps us to choose. And ultimately, this is about you go to the physician over the next five to ten years, you will be sequenced, you will be profiled, and that will help if you have a really emergency case, the way the first decision will be made will be improved by this information. You will be able to choose, if it's serious, the cancer drug that is more likely going to make you survive. If you don't have enough time, that may, may matter a lot. It may be that you will choose the right food. Uh, we are sitting in Bavaria at the moment. Maybe it's gonna, you're going to find out that it's the, white, wheat, the wheat beer that is the good one and not the, the, the Helen or whatever they say here. Uh, and maybe you're going to find out that beer is not good for you and you can still be happy in Bavaria or the other way around. Uh, maybe the, there's going to be some engineered food that allows you to be happy and it's not alcohol. Uh, and you're still in Munich at the Oktoberfest. That's a wonderful future, isn't it? Because the Oktoberfest is great. I at least feel that way. So in this sense, personalized health is harnessing the power of diversity. Diversity is what we need in order to evolve as a species, in order to survive dangers. It's what I need as an individual, but it has bad potential impact. And personalized health is the way in which we can control the negative and let the positive survive. The best of both worlds. Great future. Thank you. <laughs>